up on this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon with President Park Geun-hye and the leader of Belgium agreeing to boost the partnership between Korea and Europe in trade and science technology. A group of European companies pledge investment totaling 370 million US dollars in Korea. The operator of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant is set to begin the delicate process of removing hundreds of fuel rods from a mangled reactor. Authorities are keen to assure everything is under control. Plus, the Iranian foreign minister says he's optimistic a deal on Tehran's nuclear program could be reached with world powers when the latest round of talks in Geneva end this Friday. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. the best place for beef and bop? Les Jeux Olympiques d'hiver se dérouleront-ils à Pyeongchang? هل أنتم حقا سابع أكبر مصدر في العالم؟ كنوكاسيو أدري ديسكا. 你好, 最近哪部电视剧的人气最旺? Korea is attracting interest from around the world. The more you know, the more you want to know. Dynamic Korea. For joining us, you're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Che Yuzhan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. President Park Geun-hye is currently in Brussels on the third and final leg of her European trip. On Thursday, she held a bilateral summit with the Belgian Prime Minister, where the two leaders focused on boosting economic cooperation. Our presidential correspondent Oh Jin-ju followed this report from Brussels. President Park's bilateral talks with Belgian Prime Minister Elio de Rupo Thursday were mainly focused on boosting economic cooperation. Korea and Belgium agreed to expand their bilateral trade volume, which currently stands at 3.7 billion U.S. dollars, and investment based on the Korea-EU Free Trade Agreement. In particular, Korea has attracted a total of $370 million in foreign investment from five leading European companies, including Belgian chemical firm Salve, which will build a manufacturing factory worth $110 million in Semangum, a tidal flat on Korea's west coast. The two nations also signed an MOU to carry out joint development projects in third markets, such as Congo, Rwanda and Vietnam. And to lay the foundation for cooperation in the sector of the creative economy, Korea and Belgium will push ahead with negotiations to set up a joint committee on science technology and to sign a cooperative agreement in this field. Earlier in the day, at a meeting with Korean and Belgian scientists and businessmen, President Park emphasized Europe was a crucial partner in realizing a creative economy. Europe has been working on the development of the world's development of the world's development of the world's development. 벤처 기업을 활성화시켜서 글로벌 강서 기업으로 발전시켜 온 곳입니다. The president wrapped up her first day in Brussels by attending a dinner banquet hosted by King Philippe. On Friday, the last day of her Europe tour, President Beck is scheduled to hold summit talks with leaders of the European Council and EU Commission. They're expected to adopt a joint declaration with this year marking the 50th anniversary of diplomatic ties, setting a vision for future cooperation. Oh jin Arirang News, Brussels. The Korean government is throwing its full support behind the domestic medical industry's push to expand overseas. Officials say they want to boost Korea's medical-related export volume to well over 2 billion U.S. dollars by 2017. Park Ji-won reports. Finance Minister Hyun Oh Seok has pledged the government's full support to the Korean medical industry that wants to expand into international markets amid growing demand for advanced medical technologies in many developing countries. Speaking at a cabinet meeting Friday, Hyun said the government will soon draw up a special law to provide the legal framework and create a near 50 million U.S. dollar fund to support the Korean medical industry expand overseas. 
The support will be jointly funded by the public and private sectors with the nation's health ministry, state-run financial institutions and private entities joining hands to raise money. The government also plans to set up a task force and a related institute to provide administrative support and the latest information on the global medical market for the domestic industry. The government aims to more than double Korea's medical-related annual export volume to some $2.3 billion by 2017. Exports currently stands at less than $1 billion a year. Medical information systems and hospital management and care services, in addition to quality Korean medical staff and technologies, are also part of the government's plans to help Korea's world-class medical industry become more established on the global stage. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. A U.S. weapons expert says South Korea's defense capability against North Korea has improved markedly in recent years, but he warned against reducing the number of boots on the ground. Our defense ministry correspondent Han Dan reports. Richard White, an American senior researcher at the Hudson Institute, is surprised at the vast improvement South Korea has made in its defense capability against North Korea. During a forum hosted by the Korea Economic Institute, the defense expert noted the remarkable development of the South's defense industry, not only in terms of domestic consumption, but also exports. He said Seoul has shown such huge progress in its preemptive strike abilities against Pyongyang that has not only alarmed the North, but also China and the U.S. Whites explained the preemptive strike scenario, which involves various weapons such as ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and other long-range artillery, has come on leaps and bounds since North Korea's sinking of a South Korean warship and its shelling of Yeonpyeong Island in 2010. He also pointed out Seoul's weaknesses against North Korea. Whites warned of the possible risks that could arise with the reduced number of South Korean ground forces in case the North Korean regime collapses. When asked about South Korea's delayed fighter jet deal, he suggested Seoul expand its budget, reduce the number of planned purchases to below 60, or delay the entry timeline of its first jet until after 2017. Noting that Lockheed Martin has taken orders from several countries for its F-35, the U.S. expert hinted the defense firm will lower the price of the jet given the increased production. Lockheed Martin missed out on the initial bid due to its high price tag, but as the South Korean government is relaunching the fighter jet deal from Square One, the F-35 is the jet the Air Force wants due to its strong stealth capacity. And then, added a news. The United States says it's ready to send its special envoy for North Korean human rights to Pyongyang if the North issues an invitation. The move is raising expectations that Robert King will attempt to negotiate the release of a jailed Korean American. U.S. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Marie Half told Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency on Thursday that King is preparing to travel to the North Korean capital on a humanitarian mission focused on securing Kenneth Bay's release. Bay was arrested in North Korea a year ago and was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for committing an unspecified crime against the state. An official at South Korea's foreign ministry said King is scheduled to visit Seoul on November 18th, but the official wasn't aware the U.S. official was planning a visit to Pyongyang. The Constitutional Court has begun preparations to determine whether the minor opposition Unified Progressive Party is unconstitutional, the first of its kind in the history of the Korean Constitution. Earlier this week, the government filed a petition with the court to dissolve the party, saying that it is pursuing North Korean socialism. Our Kim Hyun-ji has more. The nine judges on the Constitutional Court on Thursday held their first meeting on the government's petition to dissolve the Unified Progressive Party. Earlier this week, the Pekin administration categorized the minor Progressive Party as unconstitutional and requested the Constitutional Court disband it and revoke the status of the party's lawmakers, removing them from their posts. This is the first time since 1959 that the government in peacetime has attempted to dissolve a political party. 
In 1959, the Ministry of Public Information forced the Progressive Party to disband. Although the Supreme Court ruled that the party's platform was not unconstitutional. Party leader Cho bong am was executed that year for violating the national security law. But the Supreme Court declared him not guilty in a retrial held in 2011. In the current case, the Constitutional Court will review the government's petition to disband the Unified Progressive Party and decide whether to temporarily suspend its activities. The court says it has ordered the UPP submit a defense and will set a date for oral arguments once it receives the materials from the UPP. If the court decides to apply an injunction, the UPP's six lawmakers will be temporarily banned from all parliamentary activities. With the injunction, the UPP will not be able to field candidates for next year's local elections, nor receive party subsidies paid for by the government. The UPP was scheduled to receive a subsidy of 640,000 U.S. dollars next Friday, but it is uncertain whether it will get the money now. The six UPP lawmakers are currently staging a hunger strike to protest the government action after having their heads shaved Wednesday in protest. They refute the government's claim that they have links to North Korea and have received orders from Pyongyang. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. More than two years after an earthquake and tsunami devastated the Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan, officials are uh, beginning the delicate and dangerous process of removing nuclear fuel rods from the area. They also vowed to complete the purification of the contaminated water by early 2015. Rakani Lee has more. A major cleanup operation is set to start at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in Japan as early as next week, the first of its kind since the March 2011 meltdown. The head of the plant, Akira Ono, announced on Thursday that Japanese engineers will soon begin extracting fuel rods from the plant's reactor number four. Unlike reactor numbers one and two, number four did not melt down and is said to have the most fuel assemblies. Plant operator TEPCO says this cleanup process is groundbreaking and that it will require a certain delicacy, considering the fragility of the facilities and other potential dangers. But during a tour of the site with the press on Thursday, plant chief Ono downplayed any safety concerns. We have removed spent fuel many times, he said, so we don't think we are going to be doing anything that is very dangerous. The cleanup operation at reactor number four is expected to take more than 13 months, and the decommissioning or dismantling of the entire plant is expected to take decades, possibly 30 to 40 years. The announcement of the cleanup operation comes amid growing concerns voiced by experts who say that the fuel removal process could be too risky and that a massive earthquake could trigger a major nuclear reaction. Connie Lee, Arirang News. China has reportedly developed a large unmanned aerial vehicle that has an engine made solely with Chinese technology. The story was reported by a Chinese online community site, which quoted experts as saying that the drone has a range of 7,000 kilometers, which theoretically uh, puts it within reach of a disputed island chain in the East China Sea that is claimed by both China and Japan. Currently, only a handful of nations, the US, Israel and India, use aerial drones as part of their military strategy. And in related news, the U.S. website Defense News, citing Chinese media reports, says China is currently building a special industrial base in Beijing for the development and production of drones. The base's estimated output is projected to top $16 billion by 2025. Now, all eyes are on the Philippines this Friday as super typhoon Haiyan, one of the most powerful storms in recent times, has made landfall there. The storm slammed into Sama province early Friday, packing gusts of almost 280 kilometers an hour and dumping torrential rain on the area. Authorities say Haiyan, at over 800 kilometers wide, is poised to cause extensive devastation and significant loss of lives. Millions of people have been evacuated to safer ground or storm shelters in response to the oncoming storm. Locally known as, known as Yolanda, the maximum Category 5 super typhoon is expected to exit the Philippines 
late on Saturday a move into the South China Sea in the direction of Vietnam. Schools and offices have been closed in the most vulnerable regions, while flights and ferry services have also been cancelled. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Chae Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. Talks between Iran and world powers on Tehran's disputed nuclear program have gotten off to a good start in Geneva, with both sides expressing cautious optimism. Our Song ji has the latest. On the first day of the Geneva talks, the six world powers accepted the framework of Iran's proposal for interim partial deal. Official from the five permanent UN Security Council members, the United States, Russia, China, Britain and France, plus Germany, also known as P5 plus 1, were at the talks to discuss Iran's plans. Iranian Deputy Foreign Minister Abbas Arakchi said, although it was too early to say with certainty whether a deal would be possible this week, he was optimistic about it. The world powers are expected to demand Iran immediately stop developing its nuclear program in exchange for a limited lifting of sanctions in which the core sanctions architecture would remain. In exchange for concrete, verifiable measures to address the P5 plus 1's concerns during the first step, the P5 plus 1 would consider limited, targeted, and reversible relief that does not affect our core sanctions architecture. Meanwhile, Israel is opposed to such a deal, saying it would be a historic mistake allowing Iran to retain Israel the capabilities totally to make nuclear weapons. Song ji -sun. Arirang News. The Pakistani Taliban has a new head, hardline commander Mullah Fazlullah, and his first order of business was to vow revenge for his predecessor's death. Fazlullah's rise to leader will almost certainly shut down any possibility of peace talks with the Pakistani government. Former leader Hakimullah Mesud, who had been in talks with the government, was killed in a drone st strike earlier this month. Taliban spokesperson says Fazlullah is against any, uh, all negotiations with Pakistan and will target the military and the governing party. Fazlullah was the man responsible for personally ordering the shooting of the schoolgirl activist who spoke out against the Taliban's restriction on girls' education. Britain's spy chiefs gave public televised testimony to British lawmakers for the first time ever on Tuesday, on Thursday rather, amid a fierce debate over intelligence tactics following allegations of spying on other governments. The hearing by a parliamentary committee was called in the aftermath of the release of documents by former US security contractor Edward Snowden that indicated Washington and London had established intelligence gathering posts around the world. They also said both countries used sophisticated eavesdropping equipment to intercept the personal communications of top Western leaders and politicians. The head of MI6, Sir John Sawyers, said the leaks had damaged national security by alerting targets and adversaries to Britain's capabilities. The televised proceeding had a two-minute delay in case one of the officials inadvertently revealed a state secret. The European Central Bank has cut Eurozone interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point to a new record low of 0.25%. The move comes after a surprise drop in Eurozone inflation to 0.7% in October, the lowest level since January 2010, and well below the ECB's target of just under 2%. Prices in Greece, one of the Eurozone members worst hit by the economic crisis, have not risen since July. Some economists are also worried about deflation in Spain. Immediately following the announcement, the euro fell against the greenback to 1.33 US dollars. The mm. European Central Bank last cut its rate in May. It was the most hotly awaited public offering since Facebook, and the little blue bird got off to a flyer with shares in the microblogging site Twitter soaring more than 73 percent in the first day of trading on the New York Stock Exchange. The company, with its 230 million users, has never actually made a profit, but it didn't seem to matter because as soon as Twitter began trading its shares at 26 U.S. dollars, the price soared to almost 45 dollars. 
Twitter, which is only around seven years old, is now valued at a staggering $31 billion. Analysts have been close, closely watching Twitter's finances since it announced its intention to float as the company is still losing money. There are concerns excessive advertising on the site could change the nature of the Twitter experience and turn people away, but others say Twitter has become the hub for global news and views and there's no limit to its reach. U.S. food safety officials say they are taking steps to ban the use of artery-clogging trans fats in food in a move hailed by health experts as life-saving. The Food and Drug Administration said Thursday that trans fats, also known as partially hydrogenated oils, are no longer generally recognized as safe. The FDA says a ban which could spell the end for many Americans' favorite processed foods could prevent 7,000 deaths and 20,000 heart attacks in the U.S. every year. If the plan is approved, trans fats will be classified as food additives and won't be allowed in foods unless they are officially approved. Some of the food that will be affected includes fast food, microwave popcorn, frozen desserts, coffee creamer, chewy candy and margarine. Fans of most meat and dairy, product, dairy products needn't be too concerned, however, as naturally occurring trans fats will not be affected by any ban. Okay, well, winter appears to be rapidly approaching, doesn't it? So let's get a check on the weather update with, uh, on this very chilly Friday afternoon with our weathercaster, E. Gian, who's standing by. Hello there, Gian. Well, happy Friday, guys. Now, the college entrance exam ended yesterday, and there was a survey asking what the test takers wanted to do most after the test was over. Now, guess which activity was number one? Hmm. Well, I would say uh, probably going out for some drinks, probably, <laughs> uh, but maybe they're too young. Or, or rather just uh, spending time with their family or friends. What do you think, Yusin? Mm. Well, shops offer special discounts right, for test right. takers after the exam. So mm. if I were one of them, I would have said shopping. Well, yeah. you guys, your responses are high on the list, but number one was spending time on their appearance. Well, in Korea, high school prohibit dyeing your hair, getting a perm, or wearing a makeup. But after the college entrance exam, schools go easy on those rules for seniors. And in the survey, 24% of test takers said they would spend time on their looks. Interesting, huh? Well, otherwise, what a chilly Friday we are having. Uh, we had the coldest morning of the season in most regions, and the afternoon highs will only soar into the low to mid teens and the cold and flu activity level is higher than usual so please keep this in mind and take good care of yourself to not to get sick by dressing warmly and washing your hands frequently well right now we are looking at a few clouds passing over the peninsula but more clouds might be rolling in later in the day and tomorrow skies will be cloudy in the morning in advance of rain showers that will move in in the afternoon nationwide and you can also expect to see a few lingering showers till Sunday morning and after the uh, rain lets up expect to have a cold Sunday in the Seoul metro area with temperatures staying in the single digits all day long so with that in mind let's take a closer look at today's readings now the Seoul will make it to 14 degrees Celsius which is 57 degrees in Fahrenheit and Daegu and Gwangju will get up to 17 while Busan will see a high of 19. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will also get up to 17 in the afternoon under mostly sunny skies and Daejeon and Dokdo will top out at 15 and 13 while Mount Kungang will make it to 7.
Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. That's all for me this week. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. And now let's send it back to Mark and Yusan in the studio. Thank you very much, Gion. You have a wonderful weekend too. And that's it for this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon. And we will be back at the same time next Monday. Until then, do stay with Arirang TV for more on the day's headlines.